What is up, my exchange family from all over the world? And thank you for tuning in to another episode of Chief Chat. My name is Chief Master Sergeant Kevin Osby, and I'm your senior enlisted advisor for the Army and Air Force Exchange Service. Before we get started with our guest today, I'd like to introduce you to, introduce you to my lovely co-hosts, Leah Matthews and Julie Mitchell. How y'all doing, ladies? Hey, Hi, good Chief. to see you guys. Hi, Chief. Hi, Julie. Oh, I, Hi, Leah. I see y'all. I see y'all are representing, and we, we got some Texas Rangers gear on, and and we do, do we do? Because it's I a special get, day. I didn't get the memo at all. Like, what happened? I, <laughs> I thought we had a group text going on. Did I get cut out the group text or what? So <laughs> we we knew you would want to wear your uniform today. Yes, well, I'm wearing my Texas uh, Rangers gear in spirit, but I do want to uh, let people know. I want to have a moment of silence. Uh, can I have a moment of silence? Um, you can. Absolutely. Yes, sir. Mm. Okay, moment of silence for the uh, Airman <laughs> Battle uniform that I have on today because today is the last day that we are authorized to wear this this particular uniform in the Air Force. And so uh, paying homage today, uh, it, it, I had a, a bunch of great memories in this uniform and now I have to convert it into some weird cutoff shorts or some lawn care attire that, that just looks weird when I get retired and all that other stuff. So, um, but. <laughs> The last day for the airman battle uniform but i i am super excited about our guest today because we got get to talk sports and i love sports uh and a baseball season is is starts this week so uh J julie without further ado please introduce today's guest you guys it is it's my favorite season it's baseball season it's opening week for major league baseball and we're excited to have a legendary broadcaster with us today he's been with the texas rangers for more than 40 years has won the texas sportscaster of the year award an incredible eight times and he's been enshrined in the broadcast wing of the national baseball hall of fame and museum please help us welcome the voice of the texas rangers eric nadell to chief chat Hey, Eric. How you doing? Woo! Thanks for having me. Good Rangers. Eric, thanks so much for joining us and for everybody watching. You know what to do. Drop a note in the comments. Let us know where you're watching from. Share your love with Eric there. And if you have any questions, you can leave those there too. We'll read those live uh, throughout the broadcast. Now is a great time to start your watch party to enjoy this live interview with your friends. And if you're not following our page, well, you should because Chief Chats are every week and we have terrific military exclusive guests for you all spring. Absolutely. So Eric, man, it's great to meet you and thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks for having me. It's an exciting time, uh, opening day. You know, in a lot of cases, it's the best day of the year, depending on how <laughs> your team does. <laughs> and, <laughs> so I'm really looking forward to tomorrow, even though the, the Rangers are not playing at home. The Rangers are playing in Kansas City tomorrow. And because of the continuing COVID restrictions, I won't be in Kansas City. I'll be broadcasting the games off TV monitors in our home ballpark in Arlington, Texas. Oh, wow. This is how we did all the road games last year. And this is how we will be doing the road games, at least for the first couple of months of the season this year, hoping that maybe the restrictions will loosen up later on and we'll be able to travel with the team as we normally did. Okay. Oh. Well, man, well, I hope, hopefully it does get, get better. I know we're all waiting for this freaking pandemic to, to go away and, and so we can get back to, you know, kind of some sense of normalcy but uh can you can you tell our viewers where you're calling from and uh how, how have you been faring during that during the pandemic uh thanks i'm in dallas texas um you know i've been here i actually moved here in 1976 to broadcast minor league hockey games oh wow dallas blackhawks who were a triple a team at that time and i've lived here ever since um i have fared well during the pandemic i've stayed safe uh i was able to get a vaccine uh, very early, you know, being over 65 years of age. So my wife and I have both had uh, both shots. Uh, working last year in a shorter season, a 60 game season, where we weren't allowed to travel. There were no fans in the ballpark. There were cardboard fans <laughs> and, and piped in crowd noise. That was the strangest thing that I've ever had to do as a broadcaster. I don't know which was weirder doing the home games with cardboard fans in the ballpark <laughs> We're doing the road games off TV monitors. <laughs> the whole thing was strange, and it all happened in a new stadium. The Rangers opened a brand new stadium last year, uh, you know, with a retractable dome, so that the weather conditions were always perfect in there. But there were no fans to enjoy it. It was just completely bizarre. 
Well, I know uh, one of my goals in life is to be a cardboard cutout at, at a some sports <laughs> event. So, so hopefully we can make that happen. If somewhere uh, we can, we can be. We, could, me, Julie, and uh, Leah have uh, some cardboard cutout somewhere. I think the price is right. I think you. I think you can buy your way in on that. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Well, we're definitely looking forward to looking forward to it being baseball time in Texas once again. Uh, Forty three years with the same team, sir. That is quite an accomplishment. How did you get started with the Rangers, and then did you ever imagine sticking around for so long? I was just really lucky. Almost all of my jobs in broadcasting, it was a matter of being in the right place at the right time. You know, obviously, you have to have a certain amount of talent, but in this business, you need a lot of luck as well. And I just happened to be here broadcasting minor league hockey games, you know, with a goal of being a National Hockey League announcer. Uh, when I was told that our minor league team, which was owned by the Dallas, by the Chicago Blackhawks, they were going to move their minor league operation from Dallas to Moncton, New Brunswick, Canada. Oh. And they couldn't take me with them. I don't know if I would have wanted to go, but I couldn't have gone because they had to hire all Canadians up there. They couldn't have gotten a, a working visa for me. So I was about to be out of a job. And just clearly, coincidentally, out of the blue, I got a call from the broadcasting manager of the Texas Rangers as they were looking to hire a young announcer uh, as one of their announcers was planning to retire within a year or two. And they wanted to hire a young guy who they could kind of school as an intern almost uh, to replace that guy named Bill Merrill. And they let me audition for the job. I had never broadcast baseball, although I grew up playing it. And I grew up in New York listening to some of the greatest baseball announcers in the history of the game, Mel Allen and Red Barber and Lindsey Nelson and Bob Murphy, the Mets announcers. So I knew how a baseball game should sound, but I'd never done it. And they let me audition for four games. I did four games into a tape recorder uh, late in the 1978 season. And based on that and having a whole off season to get ready, they hired me to start in 1979. But I think if I weren't local, where they had a lot of local references on me, I had met some people in the Rangers organization. And most important, they didn't have to pay movie expenses. <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> they saved so they take a chance on me, which is rare. You know, it could, could never happen now, probably, where a guy who'd never done a baseball game would get a major league job unless he was an ex-player. Um, so, you know, I was very lucky to get the opportunity and they basically let me learn on the job. You know, they were extremely patient with me and, you know, I'll, I'm forever grateful for that. Excellent, Eric. So what have been, what have been some of the biggest changes that you've seen from a broadcasting perspective in those 43 years? And then how has your job evolved over time? You know, I think the biggest changes all have occurred as a result of the internet. Uh, when I started in 1979, the information we would get would be supplied by the team, and it wasn't a whole lot. We would get one sheet of statistics, and I think the Rangers media guide was 24 pages back then. And then as the years went by, teams were doing more and more detailed media guides. There were more detailed statistical sheets given to us each day. Uh, but to get the best information, I had to talk to people. I had to go talk to the other team's manager to find out you know, what his plans were for his team. Uh, I would try to talk to as many players as I could. Uh, I would talk to the broadcasters from the other team. That's really how I got the best information. That hasn't changed. But just about everything else has. Now you can go online to any number of websites, whether it's ESPN or MLB.com, or for the more uh, baseball purist type fans, fan graphs and baseball savant and things like that to get the more analytical detailed statistics. Fans can now get all the same information that I can if they just wanna put in the work. Um, but there's so much more information available. Uh, the challenge used to be, how am I going to get enough stuff to fill all the dead time in a baseball game? Now it's more a matter of what stuff's really interesting out of the massive information that's out there. Uh, unfortunately, now during the pandemic, we can't get the best information, the most interesting information, because I can't go down to the locker room and talk to whatever player I want every afternoon as we used to. Uh, mm -hmm. Now the team supplies usually one player a day on a Zoom call so that everybody's on the call. I don't get any private time with a player. Mm -hmm. uh, the manager does one. And then after the game, same thing. They supply one or two players 
to the media at large and the manager. So, you know, my best sources of information uh, are gone, but hopefully uh, as COVID comes to an end, you know, we'll have access to the players again, but th there's just so much information out there. It's, it's really changed everything. The one other thing I should mention with regard to the internet is social media. It used to be if fans wanted to get a hold of me, uh, comment on my broadcast, they would send me a letter. <laughs> we would get the actual mail. You know, every day there'd be mail call, and a Ranger employee would would come into our booth with a few letters from fans. And now anybody <laughs> with me can go to my Twitter feed or my Instagram feed, you know, and shout out to me there. Uh, I don't do Facebook anymore. It just became too overwhelming. But I still have Twitter and and Instagram. And anybody who wants to get hold of me can do that. And I actually, I really like that. Um, you know, we get a lot of feedback, mostly positive, not entirely. Uh, but I love the fact that, you know, fans can communicate with me. I think about when I was a kid, you know, and I would write letters to my favorite broadcaster and sometimes they'd write back and sometimes they wouldn't. Um, it's, it's a great opportunity, you know, to have a feel for what your fan base actually is. Oh, between yeah. technology, oh, I'm sorry, Chief, no, go ahead. No, you go, you go ahead. Jean. I was just going to say, between technology and the pandemic, you have seen so many changes, um, especially as of as of late. That's that's incredible, really. I, I didn't realize that you weren't able to go to the away games and that you were having to watch those on TV mm -hmm. and call them. That's amazing. And that's a testament to your skill, making um, listeners at home feel like they're in a ballpark that you're not even in. Like, that's that blows yeah. my mind. We've somehow <laughs> learned how to do it. And, you know, there are things that we miss, you know, in particular, if somebody hits a hard line drive, either to first or to third, usually the TV director can't switch camera shots in time. Uh, so sometimes the, the batter swings and the next thing we see the balls in right field and we don't know how it got there. We don't know if it's <laughs> his, his legs, Man. hit a pebble and bounced over his head. Sometimes they show us a replay, but sometimes they don't. Um, you know, when a ball's hit up the alley and the bases are loaded and there's runners running everywhere and fielders, you know, from our booth in the stadium, we can kind of see everything, but we are limited to the camera shot that we get in calling a game off TV monitors. And they do give us a second shot. In addition to the one shot that follows the ball generally, they give us what they call an all nine shot, which is an overhead view of the whole field. So we can see where the fielders are and we can see where the runners are. But it gets pretty confusing trying to work off the two monitors because your head's going like this. <laughs> and at the end of the play, you're just completely <laughs> dizzy. Yeah. Um, but they're doing it in every sport. You know, the, the hockey announcers did the, you know, they did the Stanley Cup playoffs last year off TV monitors. And, you know, most of the ESPN announcers who are doing national games, uh, mm -hmm. they're not present at the game anymore. You know, we're all kind of learning how to do this. And, you know, it's a challenge. I like to think of it that way. It's an adventure. Um, but it's not nearly as much fun as being in the stadium. No. Oh. Yeah, I, I would, I'd be freaking out about my internet service, to be honest with you. So <laughs> if I'm at home and I'm trying to do this and, and I'm just like, oh, <laughs> my kids are on doing school and yeah, that, that probably would be super nerve wracking. That's why they're making us do it from the stadium. So okay, got gotcha, you. Gotcha. Go to the stadium as if the game was being played there, but instead of looking at the field, we're looking at two TV monitors in the very same booth where we would be doing the home games. Okay, okay, awesome. Because I, I think I send their guys to the studio of the TV station to do it. Um, I like going to the ballpark. At least you kind of have the feel that you're going to a baseball game. Yeah. Absolutely. absolutely. Mm -hmm. so, so for people that don't know, in your senior year of college, you were working as a janitor, uh, which, yeah. which, which to be honest with you, I spent the first year of my military career as a janitor as well. So that we had to clean up every freak, everything. So, uh, so, <laughs> So uh, can you kind of take us on that journey? You went from kind of doing your stuff as a janitor, but you were also sending in audition tapes uh, for your broadcasting job. Right. I went to Brown University and they didn't have any broadcasting classes or even journalism classes. I was a political science major <laughs> thinking about going to law school. But from the time I was a little kid, I thought it would be really cool to get paid to watch sporting events and talk about them. And at Brown, I had a chance to broadcast uh, hockey and football games on the college radio station. And I really loved hockey. I always 
always really loved hockey growing up in New York. And Marv Albert used to be the radio announcer for the New York Rangers. Oh, wow. When I was a kid. And I used to tell people all the time that asked me, what do you want to be when you grow up? And I said, I want to be Marv Albert. You know, I want to be the voice of the Rangers. I just wasn't specific enough. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Well, you know, I wound up being the Texas Rangers instead of the New York Rangers. But in any event, I, you know, I got pretty good doing hockey games. And my senior year in college, um, I, I actually had enough credits to graduate in January of my senior year. So the last semester, I kind of doubled down on my hours in my college job, which was being a janitor in fraternity house, and worked oh. on getting the best possible audition tape and sending it out to all the minor league hockey teams in the country. And when I graduated, I didn't have a job yet. So my parents, you know, who had spent all this money on this fancy <laughs> Ivy League education, you know, came out to Providence, Rhode Island to celebrate my graduation, you know, for their son, the janitor. And <laughs> about a month later, I got a call from the owner of the team in Muskegon, Michigan, uh, whose announcer had just quit. And he went into his file and, you know, Mine happened to be on the top and he called me and we had a conversation for about an hour and you know, he called me back the next day and offered me the job and not having any idea where Muskegon, Michigan was. Um, I got a map and drove out to Muskegon, Michigan to start broadcasting minor league hockey games. And, and then one job led to another. I, I got a job in Oklahoma City uh, after three years in Muskegon, Michigan. And then after one year in Oklahoma City, I got the job here in Dallas and that led to the Rangers job. Awesome. Well, Eric, it's often said that baseball is America's pastime. And right now we have America's heroes joining us from all over the world today. What words of inspiration do you have for our soldiers, airmen, guardians, sailors, Marines, Coast Guard members, and military families who are tuning in? Well, you know, when I started doing this, there was usually one game a day in Major League Baseball that was on the Armed Forces radio network. And um, I don't know if yeah. that's still the case. If it is, they don't tell us. They used to tell <laughs> us, and we would do a shout out, you know, a couple of times a game. It was really exciting for us to mm -hmm. know that there were service men and women all around the world listening to our broadcast. I guess now they don't tell us because we know that there are people listening on their phones and on their computers and on their iPads all over the world. And uh, it really struck me um, during the uh, first uh, Iraq war, uh, when I got a letter, um, an actual mailed letter uh, from a serviceman who was based in Afghanistan and said that he and his buddies would listen to the Ranger games in their tents. Mm -hmm. And he was from the Dallas-Fort Worth area. And they actually sent us a flag uh, and a special coin, one of those special coins. Wow. And wow. he said he would be getting out in about a year you know, would it be possible to meet us? So we created this great event when, you know, when he got out and came to see us, we had Derek come up to the booth and he sat oh. with us. Oh, and yes. it, it really brought home the fact that you know, we and the other baseball announcers, you know, all around the country uh, are entertaining our service people around the world. And it was, it was such, such a jolt, such as uh, an inspiration for us, a uh, shot of adrenaline really you know, these people are risking our lives and we're getting the opportunity to bring some joy into their lives and just, you know, really reassuring to us. And, you know, I grew up during the Vietnam War era, mm -hmm. you know, and there was a lot of division in the country about whether we should be involved in this war. Um, there was a draft, you know, a lot of people who were in the military were not in by choice. And, you know, the people who were opposed to the war generally had a negative view toward the people fighting the war, which, you know, was not right. And I am so delighted that these days, whatever your political feelings are and whatever your opinions are about where we should or shouldn't have troops, everybody appreciates the fact that the people who are there are serving the country. And, you know, and when they come home, you know, they're not greeted, you know, with rejection and derision the way they were back in that era. You know, when I was the same age as so many of the young service people. And, and, you know, that's really gratifying to me. You know, I'm, you know, we're all so thankful for what the service men and women are doing. And now that there's unanimity about that, you know, it's, it's just great to know and great to be in a position where I'm, you know, I'm helping to entertain them while they're serving the country. Yeah. 
Well, um, well, I'm glad you mentioned about the Vietnam uh, area era vet veterans because uh, we are double back. We're double backing right now to to make sure we 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 thank them properly. Uh, so we just had a recent event where uh, if you're a Vietnam vet, you can come to the exchange and get and get a, a pin and get a, uh, you know some recognition at, at the local uh, installation that you're around. So uh, we definitely appreciate all the Vietnam vets out there and uh, thank you for your service. And we, we, we definitely appreciate them just as much as people appreciate us that are currently in the military right now. Yeah, and I think probably most of the, the people in the service now don't realize that uh, back in the 60s, like when I was following baseball as a teenager, you know, players would do their military service sometimes on weekends. You know, they might be in the reserve or they'd be in the National Guard. They would actually miss baseball games um, because they would go and serve for a few days or for a week. Uh, Nolan Ryan, early in his career, missed a lot of time. Uh, it was one of the reasons he didn't arrive as a full-time major leaguer, you know, when he otherwise would have. And that was not unusual at all. Uh, now, of course, players, you know, don't have to deal with those sort of stresses. Um, everything is different about the life of a player now. The players used to have off-season jobs. Even when I started in 1979, oh, wow. you know, our players – in the off season would go and sell cars or they'd work as a substitute teacher or they'd go back to their hometown and work in the mill or the plant or on a farm. Um, now players make enough money where they work out, you know, 365 days a year. And, you know, they don't have to worry about making extra money in the off season. Oh yeah, no, I, I remember when A-Rod's contract was like, oh man, he. <laughs> that, that was, was the first one that really opened his mind. Yeah, yeah, that was the first <laughs> contract that was like, wow, okay. Hmm. Like, yeah, he don't have to worry about working at all. <laughs> yeah, I remember my first year with the Rangers, uh, they signed a player named Richie Zisk. And again, this was 1978 when I got hired. Uh, and they gave him a 10-year contract uh, worth $2 million. Not $2 million a year, a total of $2 million. It was 200000 a year uh, for 10 years. You know, which is still, you know, very good money. But yeah. at that time, it was just, you know, it seemed ludicrous. But <laughs> yeah. <laughs> to guarantee a player, you know, that much money, you know, and mm -hmm. now the average major league salary is more than that. Yeah. Course, right. <laughs> very low percentage of baseball players make it to the major leagues. But, you know, if you do make it, you know, the average salary is more than that. So as we've mentioned, you have had an incredible career. You were inducted into the broadcaster's wing at the National Baseball Hall of Fame and Museum back in 2014. What did that honor mean to you? That was, it was surreal, you know, especially since the first two announcers who received that award and were enshrined in Cooperstown are the two guys who I first listened to as a kid, Mel Allen and Wed Barber. And, and to me, those guys are like in a whole different category. <laughs> Uh, and then Vin Scully, the longtime voice of the Dodgers, who I think every every baseball announcer acknowledges is the best to ever do this. You know, he was one of the first winners. And then the two announcers who did the Mets games when I was growing up, Bob Murphy and Lindsey Nelson, were enshrined. You know, for me to win an award that those guys won, and have you know my plaque be on the same wall with them, it, it almost seems like like somebody made a mistake. <laughs> you know, there should be a recount or something. But I guess, you know, it's a whole different era. The, the kids who are growing up listening to me probably feel right. the same way about me as I felt about those guys. But just a, an unbelievable honor. And the weekend, you know, when I was enshrined and got to make, you know, a speech on national TV in front of a big audience, you know, at Doubleday Field, uh, I was surrounded by Hall of Fame players. Uh, they let you stay in a hotel that only the Hall of Fame players and their families can stay in. Oh, cool. <laughs> I went out to the maid's cart, you know, and, and Reggie Jackson is taking towels off the maid's cart. <laughs> you know, and, you know, Hank Aaron is getting a Coke at the Coke machine. And it was like I was either in a dream or I had sneaked into some private club and gotten away. It was... Yeah. It was remarkable, and I was never as nervous in my life, I think, as I was that whole weekend. I was, you know, I was just yeah. like a little kid in a, in a candy store. Well, I don't know. If, I, I don't know if selfies was a big thing in 2014, but I would have been in selfie mode the whole time. <laughs> I was on my best behavior. I, I restrained myself, except for <laughs> one exception. Um, there were a couple of A-list celebrities who were allowed to stay in that same hotel. Um, Tom Brokaw was there. Oh. Um, I think Larry King was there. And mm -hmm. one of my all-time favorite 
comedians and actors. Billy Crystal was there. Oh, yeah. And I did not hesitate to get my picture taken. <laughs> Good for you. That, that was probably, even with all the baseball players being there, my number one idol is the kid, Sandy Kopex, you know, who I had met a couple of times before. But getting a chance to meet and talk for a while with Billy Crystal was, that was the most special moment of the oh. weekend for me. That's Good awesome. for you. And you absolutely deserve to be there. Um, you've been, I mean, I have a teenage son who loves baseball. We've listened to you, um, you know, since he's grown up listening to ball and we're actually planning a trip to the Hall of Fame next year for his high school graduation. So we'll be oh, sure right. to check out your plaque. So um, yeah, you, you definitely belong there. You're an institution for sure. Thank you so much. Absolutely. And just want to pause for a second where, um, and take a look at the live feed. There are a lot of Eric Nadell fans out there. So you're getting a lot of love right now in the comments section. And I'll just share a few of those. So Bobby says, loved going to Rangers games at the old ballpark in Arlington when I was stationed in Dallas. Um, and let me, let me read a couple of comments from Chief's page. Uh, Bobby, a different Bobby says, love Eric Nadell calling Ranger games one of the best in the business. And then we have a lot of baseball fans that are saying, go Red Sox, go Cubs, <laughs> go Rays. Uh, but they're still tuning in to see and hear about you, Eric. So I think they're your fan too. Maybe they don't want to say go Rangers. <laughs> you know, these days um, with the MLB at bat app, and MLB.com, um, you can actually buy a subscription to Game Day Audio. I think it costs about $20 unless they raise the price. And you can listen to every announcer for every team in every language that it's broadcast. Wow. You know, a lot of teams, most teams, I think, have their games broadcast in Spanish. Some teams have games on in Japanese and in Korean. Um, and you can listen to all different announcers. And that's one of the things that's changed too. It used to be that I was pretty sure that 95% of the people listening to me were Ranger fans. Well, that's not necessarily the case. Anymore. <laughs> In fact, on Sirius XM, uh, they only carry the home team's broadcast. So if we're playing the Boston Red Sox and we're playing in Texas, anybody listening to that broadcast on Sirius XM is listening to me, you know, even if you're a Red Sox fan. So uh, we keep that in mind a little bit. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so well, we, no, go ahead. I'm sorry, Chief. We do oh, have ahead, one, one question. So Bobby says, what do you see in the future of sports broadcasting with the recent changes in the Valley's network transition? Um, well, he's referring, I think, to uh, here in, in Dallas, Fort Worth, uh, and the other regional sports networks. It's gone from being for here, for example, Fox Sports Southwest to being Valley Sports Southwest. And we're all kind of waiting. We, you know, we don't know, you know, gambling in baseball has been a very controversial issue over the years. In recent years, baseball has started, you know, getting involved uh, with various uh, gambling websites and fantasy baseball websites and that sort of thing. Uh, so this is the first year of the Valley's transition. It's a really good question. Uh, I don't know any more than anybody else, but we've all kind of imagined the worst possible scenarios sure. uh, and, you know, and we'll wait and see. But we also are thinking that this may very well foreshadow what happens in, in the next baseball expansion. Baseball has always been resistant to allowing Las Vegas to have a team. And it would seem to be the most natural place to add a team, you know, when baseball adds another city. Now that baseball is involved with DraftKings and with Bally's uh, in partnerships, you know, it just seems ludicrous to say that Las Vegas shouldn't have a team because of the danger of players being exposed to <laughs> Yeah. And, uh, so you know, I don't know what it's going to mean for the regional TV coverage, but the other thing that's going on right now, as I understand it, is, the, the regional TV networks don't have agreements with some of the TV providers. And so there are some fans who are actually aren't going to be able to see their local mm. TV games, you know, if they're not, you know, with the proper you know, TV providers, uh, which it's good for us, the radio announcers, we'll have more people listening to radio who otherwise might have list, listened to the TV announcers and watch TV, but that's not what we want. Mm -hmm. We want everybody to 
have the availability of the games on television. Mm -hmm. Sorry, um, Julie. I was going to say, do you see, do you see that question? I do see a question. Um, it just came in. So Chris Ward <laughs> says, where did your signature home run call that ball is history come from? Well, when I got hired, again, I got hired in uh, like August of 1978 to start in 1979. So I had a whole off season to get ready to be a baseball announcer. And one of the things I thought about was, you know, will you have a signature home run call? Uh, a lot of guys don't. Uh, but as a kid, Mel Allen always used to say, it's going, going, gone. And Phil Rizzuto used to say, it's out of here. And I thought those were really cool. And I started thinking about something that I could have. I didn't want it to be too hokey or too corny or forced. And then one day I was at a party and somebody got up to leave and said, I'll see you all. I'm out of here. And it just struck me. Uh, I'm out of here. There's got to be some other way of saying I'm out of here. And at that same party later on, somebody got up and said, I'm history. <laughs> and I said, that's it. I'm history. That ball is history. And it even has kind of a double meaning because a home run has some historic significance. So it means the ball has left and it has some historical significance. And I figured, well, I'll try it. And the first time a Ranger hit a home run in a game I was broadcasting, I used it and, and people liked it. So uh, I stuck with it. I like it. It's awesome. I like it a lot. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. absolutely. That's, that's an amazing story. And, and we definitely want to give a shout out to Chris Ward. The person that asked that question is uh, was super instrumental in getting you on the show. And so, oh, thanks, Chris. Yeah, yeah. So big shout out to Chris Ward for, for working your magic and getting the getting legend on, on, on Chief Chat. So we appreciate mm -hmm. it. He's a good teammate. Absolutely. Big love for Chris. Love you, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so uh, Eric, Eric, baseball is is a grind, right? It's it's a 162 game schedule. And so how do you how do you maintain focus like to 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 know that this is a marathon of a season? I know last year was like we just want we really want sports. We hadn't had sports mm -hmm. or and and 60 games was was you know, it was enough or it, we probably wanted more but we were just good with 60 games but just knowing it's a 162 game schedule more than any other league uh a professional league uh how, how do you keep your maintain your focus through the, all that? You know, it's it's funny. I, I don't do all the games anymore. I find that I do need some games off. Um, but, you know, even still, there are days like in any other job, you don't necessarily feel like going to work. You know, you may not have slept well or you may have some stuff going, home, going on at home or you may not feel well physically. But I get a shot of adrenaline when I walk into the ballpark. That really helps. And I have that appreciation that I have a job where instead of going to some office that might be boring or some you know, manual labor that might be physically difficult, I get to go into a major league stadium and watch major league players play baseball. It's not that hard to get enthused about that day's work once you do that. Once you're actually in the stadium and looking at the field, um, it usually gets me energized. Because it's important when I go on the air, I've got to have a smile in my voice. I've got to have some energy in my voice. You know, if I'm not feeling good, I don't want that to show. You know, I don't, I don't want to impose that on the audience. I want them, you know, to have a joyful experience. Uh, so I've got to sound cheerful. It really isn't, it really isn't that hard. Um, you do have to make sure you get enough sleep. You know, make sure you stay healthy. You know, I drink a lot of water and I try and eat right. And, you know, as I've gotten older, I have to be more and more careful about that sort of stuff. Um, but still, when you come right down to it, I'm getting paid to watch Major League Baseball. Games. Yeah, absolutely. And if you can't be grateful for that and you know can't be uh, excited about that, then it's time to stop doing this. Absolutely. So what is a typical week like for you um, preparing for games? Um, there are several uh, games in a week. And then uh, what is game day like itself? Yeah, and now you know almost every day is game day in baseball. So um, my routine, um, for a home game, uh, usually I'll get to bed about 1 a.m. I'm keyed up after a game, and I usually don't get home till about midnight. And I can usually get to bed by about 1. I'll sleep till about 9. And, you know, I work out in the morning, and then I'll get, on, <clears throat> I'll get online, and I'll review what happened last night. Sometimes I'll watch 
uh, quick pitch on MLB uh, Network. Yeah. It gives you a, it's a one hour show that shows a, the highlights of all the games from the night before, you know, either that way or, you know, on the internet, I'll review, you know, what happened last night. I'll read all of the accounts of our game, both in the media that covers the Rangers and the media that covers the opposing team. And I like to do all of that before I get to the ballpark. Uh, my wife and I usually have a, a late lunch at around one o'clock, one thirty, and then I leave for the ballpark at two thirty. Uh, our manager likes to record the pregame interview that I do with him every day at three fifteen. So I get to the ballpark a few minutes after three. I do the interview with him. Under normal circumstances, at that point, I would stay downstairs and I would start visiting with players. They would go out for batting practice. I'd go out onto the field and talk to players. I might go over to the other team's locker room and visit with them and then go up to the booth and start reading all of the information that the teams have provided us about that game, the press notes. I'll go online and start looking stuff up, things that uh, I think are interesting you know, about the other team and about our team. And basically I've got until seven o'clock to prepare, uh, which is when we go on live for a 7.05 game. We take a little break at around six. We take about a half an hour and we go into the press dining room and you know, grab a bite to eat. But basically from the time I get there at three o'clock until seven, with the exception of that half hour break, mm -hmm. I'm doing all the different things that provide me with a lot of information to do that nice game. Because uh, the thing to keep in mind is the average baseball game now takes three hours and 10 yeah. minutes. The ball is in play for 15 minutes. Of that three hours. <laughs> <laughs> the, rest of, the rest of that two hours and 55 minutes is this. Yeah. <laughs> and that Hicks and I just filling time and hopefully making it sound like we're not just filling time. Exactly. Yeah. So that we love it when I uh, have a lot you, of information in order to, to do that in an entertaining way. I love it when y'all talk about the uniforms, like, hey, today they're wearing road gray or whatever like there'll be like a good good info on the uniform and we always kind of <laughs> chuckle at that but i we look forward to listen to hearing like what are they wearing today or if we can't and watch it on tv radio you know on radio you have yeah. to describe all that on tv people can see mm -hmm. um i remember growing up as a kid how interesting it was to hear and hear how a player is wearing his uniform is he's wearing his pants really baggy you know yeah. does he have his pant legs pulled up to his knees or are they all the way down to the top of his shoes you know, that's the kind of um, word picture that you paint on radio, which to me is the biggest reason that doing radio is more fun than doing TV. The, you know, the actual act of describing things, you know, is fun and, and challenging. And, you know, it lets the listener use his imagination, you know, a little bit or hers. Okay, mm -hmm. absolutely. So I, I know you get this question a whole bunch. Um, and and, and I, I don't want to make you narrow it down to just one, one occasion, but What's one of your most memorable broadcasting moments? I think the, the number one moment by far is when the Rangers finally won the pennant in 2010. Mm -hmm. Now, this is a team that started in 1972, and they hadn't gone to the World Series until 2010. And the moment where the Rangers won the pennant, when uh, Neftali Feliz, the Rangers' closer, struck out Alex Rodriguez, the former Ranger, yeah. the mm -hmm. stadium completely exploded. Um, I've never experienced you know, ecstasy like that, an emotional <laughs> moment like that. You know, I was planning to, to be silent for a few seconds and let the crowd roar. I wound up being silent for about 45 seconds because I couldn't talk. Yeah. You know, I was so overcome. Um, it was wow. so loud in there. And then there was confetti and balloons and it was just hysterical. And you know, that moment stands out above all the others. You know, I was involved in calling two no hitters that Nolan Ryan pitched and a perfect game that Kenny Rogers threw. Oh, wow. Mm -hmm. Josh Hamilton hit four home runs in a game one night, and I got to call three of the four, including the last one. And the Rangers, probably my number two highlight, uh, the Rangers scored 30 runs one night in a game in Baltimore, which is the only time that's ever happened in modern Major League history. And, wow. you know, that was, you know, an incredible moment as well. And then the Rangers did win a second pennant in 2011. And again, the moment that they clinched the pennant stands out a lot too. But but that first pennant in 2010 is above all the other ones. 
man. So you, you didn't have to you didn't have to put a lot of uh, filler space in that 30, 30 run game, man. That <laughs> <laughs> the balls didn't play a lot more longer than fifteen minutes. Then. Yeah, there was a lot going on, and it was funny. It was the first game of a double header, and you know, in a double header, the manager usually uses um, his starting players in the first game and then rests them in the second game. And our manager at that time, Ron Washington, decided to do the opposite. He used a lot of the substitute players in the first game. And oh, then wow. those guys went and scored 30 runs. <laughs> <laughs> mm-hmm. Baseball is so unpredictable. It's one of the great things about it. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Uh, and there must be so much that you love about your job. What to you is the best part? Um, the best part, you know, like I said before, just I get paid to watch Major League Baseball games. But um, I think the, the thing that strikes me every night is that I'm doing a job where I get to entertain people. Mm-hmm. And, you know, as a kid, I remember the thrill that I had every time the announcer would sign on the air and it was time to listen to a major league broadcast, whatever sport it was. And the fact that I get the opportunity to do that for other people, you know, is I'm, I'm very grateful for that. You know, it's a mm-hmm. thrill and it's a privilege that I get to be, you know, a performer, an entertainer, you know, whatever it is, you know, and bring some joy into people's lives. You know, that really came home last year during the pandemic when everybody was was housebound, mm-hmm. you know, and we heard from so many people who said the highlight of their day was when the Ranger game came on, you know, whether they watched it mm-hmm. on TV or listened to it on the radio, you know, it, it gave them a respite from, you know, all of the stresses that, you know, everybody was going through. And, you know, I think that's, you know, that's still really important to me. And when I think about, you know, retiring, which I'm sure I'll do sometime in the next few years, you know, that's one of the things that keeps striking me. Well, if I retire, I, I don't get to do that anymore. Mm-hmm. You know? And, you know, it gives me pause. Mm-hmm. Thanks for sharing that. Well, there certainly have been some very exciting Rangers teams in the last decade, and you've shared a lot of those moments with us today. And speaking of 2020, it was a rough season. Um, how do you remain upbeat and optimistic in the booth, even when the team isn't maybe performing as well? Yeah, I asked that same question my first year doing this to Herb Poore, <laughs> who was the announcer for the Cleveland Indians. And they had had a million losing seasons in a row. You know, they were never any good. They were always out of contention by the 1st of June. And I asked him how he does it. And he says, just remember, you're watching a Major League Baseball game. He mm-hmm. said, don't think of it in terms of where the two teams are in the standings. Just think of it as the wonder of watching a Major League Baseball game, the best players mm-hmm. in the world. Some of the best games that you'll see are games involving two teams that aren't necessarily contending for the pennant. But it may be a great game. You might see the best play you've ever seen in a game where one team's you know, winning 12 to 1. But the center fielder might climb up the wall and, and make an incredible catch. It actually happened. You know, the two best catches that I've ever seen in a Ranger game, Gary Matthews Jr. climbed the wall in center field and, and stole a home run from, from Mike Lamb of the Astros. Mm-hmm. It was a one-sided game. And then Ken Griffey Jr. made an unbelievable catch on Ruben Sierra in Seattle one night. It was one of those games where it was probably midnight back in Texas with the time difference. And we're wondering, you know, who the heck is listening to this game? <laughs> You know, mm-hmm. And all of a sudden, Ken Griffey Jr., you know, Spider-Man's up the wall and makes this <laughs> unbelievable catch. And I'm thinking, you know, I'm lucky to be here. You know, never mind the fact that neither one of these teams is going to win the pennant. I'm getting to watch this. Um, so you have to think of it that way. You know, once your team is out of contention, then you just start appreciating the game, you know, for the game itself. So, Eric, we have heard that you're active in the local music scene here in DFW. You host a birthday benefit concert in Dallas every year. Where did your love for music come from? And can you tell us why it is so important for you to host this benefit each year? Uh, thanks. I think my parents loved music. My mom was always playing show tunes in the house oh. growing up. <laughs> Oklahoma, South Pacific, you know, The King and I, West Side Story. Uh, and then... It all changed one day. My sister, who's three years older, brought home an Elvis Presley record. Oh. <laughs> it was a Stingo, a 78. You know, those things were like the size of a dinner plate. And it had a hound dog on one side and don't be cruel on the other side. Aww. And we played that thing until the grooves were worn out. And <laughs> we fell in love with rock and roll. And from that point on, uh, I was really hooked on music. And 
you know, I was fortunate enough uh, in here in Dallas to get the opportunity to be a part owner of a club back in 2014 called the Vagabond, where they asked me if I would book the musical acts. And I started getting involved in the local music scene and also uh, with touring musicians. And, and I started celebrating my birthday with a concert at the Kessler Theater here uh, back in 2011 and started thinking about, well, why don't we make it a benefit concert, raise money for a local charity. And I've been doing that ever since. And we had to actually cancel it last year, unfortunately, mm -hmm. because of the pandemic. But we're bringing it back this year on, on June the 10th. We'll have it at the Kessler. Um, Bastards of Soul will be the uh, headliners. They're a soul band that was about to break out nationally when the pandemic hit. They're a local band. Oh. So we're glad to have them um, headlining it. And Daphne Willis, who has opened many of the other shows and who actually had the original idea to do this, a musician friend of mine who now lives in Los Angeles, uh, she'll be the opening act. But, you know, I love getting the opportunity to give back. You know, my mom was really active in local mental health charities when I was a kid. And, uh, you know, our family has had a history uh, of mental illness and, and fighting uh, depression and anxiety and, and those sorts of things. And so, uh, you know, I've been involved you know, with a lot of local charities uh, that help people in that regard. And, and this year, the benefit, beneficiary of that concert will be the Grant Halliburton Foundation, which provides uh, suicide prevention programs and mental health programs in area schools. So, uh, you know, I, I'm really fortunate oh, wow. to have a chance, you know, because of, you know, my, my local celebrity, you know, to bring attention to great causes like that and, and help them raise some money as well. Oh, that's so great. We need it right now with the pandemic and, and um, so many people fighting through such hard things. Um, thank you for that. That's, that's really, really well done. Absolutely. Thanks. You know, the other, the other organization that I work with in a musical manner is called Cafe Momentum. It's a local restaurant. It's a nonprofit restaurant that hires juvenile offenders when they come out of their wow. detention facilities and gives them a one-year internship in the restaurant business after which almost all of them either get jobs or go on to college. And we do a once a month dinner concert there on a Sunday. Oh, wow. Um, and uh, it's a family style dinner that the musicians design in conjunction with the restaurant chefs. And then afterwards we have a concert and we have touring musicians play that show too. Uh, another concert series that had to go on hold because of the pandemic, mm. but we're bringing that one back. That one starts again on May the 23rd. And so it's been very um, gratifying to be involved with Cafe Momentum over the last few years doing that concert series. It's called the Eric Nadell Sunday Supper Concert. <laughs> Sunday Supper Concert. I love it. You have so many good things to look forward to. Baseball is back. Your benefits are back. Yeah, Life is good. <laughs> no, no. We, and we definitely appreciate you for, for, for what you do for the local community because, uh, you know, we, we're here in Dallas as well. And so, you know, knowing that we got good people like yourself out there doing stuff for the community is, is awesome. Uh, I do have a question though, a follow-on question to since you're your music head. What's your what's your go-to karaoke song? <laughs> I'll tell you what it's not. <laughs> I, I attempted uh, one night after far too many tequilas to sing what was one of my favorite songs as a kid, Ooh Child. Oh. <laughs> Um, but no, my, my usual karaoke song would probably be Heat Wave, which Linda Ronstadt popularized with a cover of what was originally a Martha and the Vandellas song. Awesome. Mm. awesome. Well, what about I, you, I, I Chief? Know with that one. It's a little safer than Ooh Child. It's a little easier to sing. <laughs> Chief, well, you well, can't ask that question and not, and not share. Yeah, well, Chief. Not, I think everybody that knows my go-to, it's Purple, <laughs> purple Rain. Prince is Purple Rain. Oh, so yeah. Uh, because you, you can talk through it. You don't have to even sing it. You can just talk. And, and so I don't have to even, uh, you know, I, I'm just reading, reading what's on the teleprompter and not even really singing. That's funny. I've tried Little Red Corvette, which has a lot of talking in it too. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Exactly. So, uh, man, we had, this is, a, this is an awesome interview. Uh, and Eric, man, it's been truly an honor to have you with us today. Uh, like you said, you, you reach so many people that you don't even realize, but uh, our military members are, are far and wide all over the world. And we, we definitely appreciate you bringing a sense of home to wherever we are in the world. Uh, and also, you know, just 
you know, distracting our mind from all the craziness that we deal with on a, on a regular basis. So uh, thank you so much for that. It was, a, it was a pleasure having you with us and sharing some of your highlights of your career. Uh, super impressive career. Uh, uh, man, you start naming off all these Hall of Famers, King Griffey's and mm -hmm. Hank Aaron. And it's like, man, you get it like you, uh, you, 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 you've lived a good life. So uh, uh, we definitely, you know, I, I, but I appreciate you for being on the show. Um, this means a lot to our, all our service members and families all over the world. And we wish you all the best on the upcoming season. Thank you so much. You know, we, we appreciate uh, what you people are doing. Uh, and the Rangers have been very active, you know, with, with the military. Um, you know, we have the honor of watching inductions usually a couple of times a year down on the field, which I imagine is just an incredible thrill for the men and women, you know, who get to have their ceremonies in a major league baseball park. Absolutely. Uh, but it's, uh, it, it brings joy to all of us and we're tremendously grateful for, for all the service men and women. Awesome, awesome. So thanks again for your time. If you don't mind uh, staying with us, uh, once we get, up, get off of live, I gotta get some information from you. Sure thing. Thanks for having me. All right. Thank you. Awesome. You chat out. You chat out.